Hi, my name is Mark Riggins, and I'm the senior pastor here at LifePoint Church. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like a little more information about our church, check out lpchurch.us. I hope today's message is an encouragement to you. Well, good morning. Hey, y'all are awake. I didn't know. I didn't know, because normally I'm at the other campus, and at this time, we're in the middle of setup, but when people first get there, they're not awake. I didn't know about here, so thank you for being awake. We, as Mark said, we're continuing in Philippians 3, and we're on a quest uh, throughout this series. We're on a quest to find joy. We're on a quest to find joy right where you are. And so that's the whole point of this series as we look what Paul wrote in Philippians, how to have joy right where we are. Now, throughout this series, we're asking you to memorize a verse. It's actually two verses. Um, And so every week we're going to go over it. So I will read it out loud and then you can say it with me. And hopefully by the end of next week, you will have scripture memorized. So our scripture for this series is found in Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5. And it says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near, Philippians 4, 4 through 5. So let's say it together, ready? Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near, Philippians 4, 4 and 5. God is so good. I'm so proud of y'all. Now, in the first week, now, first off, if you haven't, if you missed one of these messages, either week one or week two, man, I would, I would highly recommend you go to the podcast or to the website and listen to them. I'm going to give you a recap just a little bit, but it has, it's not even close to as good as what Mark has done uh, presenting the first two weeks. But one of the things that we talked about, we kind of put this fill in the blank on the screen, and it's like, yeah, if I could only blank then I would have joy. If, if I could only land that job, or if I could only get out of debt, or if I could only get into that relationship or maybe out of that relationship. I, there, some, there's just a list of things, and basically we came up with this. If only I could change my circumstances, then I would have joy. But we learned in week one that circumst- circumstances can't prevent your joy. You can find joy right where you are, no matter your circumstances. And so then we asked the question, well, what gives you joy? What gives you joy? And we had a lot of answers. Um, Some of them were quite comical, that what gives people joy. But here's the thing that we did realize in week one that we learned is no thing can give you joy. No thing can give you joy. It's more about the who in your life that can give joy rather than the what in your life. And so last week we're like, okay, but if no thing can give you joy, what do I do with all the things I have? Anybody have extra things? Let me show your hands. Let's be honest, we're in church, y'all. Jesus is looking right now. We all have things. We have lots of things. And so what do we do with all these things? If they can't bring us joy, then what do we do with all of these? And we learned last week that things can only bring you joy when leveraged for the benefit of others. Paul tells us that that's what Jesus did. He had some things, some advantages. He did not use those things for his advantage, but he used them for our advantage. And he is our model. And so things can only bring you joy when leveraged for the benefit of others. And some of you, maybe many of you are like, I get that, but I still don't get it. I still don't see the joy. I don't feel the joy. I don't experience the joy. I know it's there. And, and, and I, I probably even understand that no thing can give me joy and that if I leverage the things that I do have to benefit others, that can bring me joy. But I just don't always have joy, so I don't get it. And what if, what if joy is right in front of you, but you just can't see it? What if it's there, but you just can't see it? And we probably all believe this because sometimes we have joy And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we feel it and everybody around us knows it because we share the joy that we have. And then the very next day, it's non-existent in our life. And we know this to be true not only in our own lives, but in the people around us. The people that we live with or the people we work with, like some days they have it and they share it. And then some days, hmm, not so much. They don't have the joy. So the question that I want to wrestle with today, I want you to wrestle with today is what do you do? When you know 
joy exists. You know joy exists, but you just can't see it. You just can't find it. I remember when I actually asked my mom this week when I got my first set of glasses. She said fifth grade. Um, so I was thinking back on that, and I was in Miss Shannon's fifth grade class, and we were in the barracks, not in the main building. And I remember I got my glasses while I was in the main building. So I think fourth grade. So when I was in fourth grade, I think, um, in PE, they were doing some tests, all these tests. And one of the tests that they did was a vision test. And I don't think I did very good on it because I, I got a note sent home to my parents and it said something like this because of the reaction of my mother. Like, I don't know what kind of parents you are, but your son is blind. He can't see anything. Like, would you be a better parent? Because she was horrified. She didn't know I couldn't see and I didn't know I couldn't see. I just, I just thought that was life. And so I went to the eye doctor and I went to, to probably the best one in town because his office was in the mall. So probably the best one, right? So I go to the eye doctor and, and do all the stuff, and then I go back and I get my first set of glasses. And I, I still remember, y'all, this was a long, long time ago. I still remember when I put them on, I was like, whoa. Like, like he, he, he went ahead and, and gave me my full prescription. He probably shouldn't have. He should, probably should have stair-stepped me because I really couldn't see. So at, at first, everything was crooked. I have a really bad stigmatism. So everything was crooked. So it took a couple of days for my eyes to, to figure out what to do with these lenses that I was looking through. But I remember when I walked outside. I walked outside and for the first time, I saw leaves on the tree. I didn't know they were there. Now I knew what a leaf was. I knew, I studied it. I probably did the, you know, the, where you stick them on the paper and you do all the stuff in school. I probably did all that. I know what leaves, were. but when I looked at a tree, I didn't see the leaves. I never did. And I was so amazed that I could see the leaves. They were right in front of me, but I couldn't see them. I needed a little help with some lenses to look through to give me some focus. And many of you don't wear glasses. I can see I can see you this morning, you don't wear glasses, but many of you understand this because just a week before last, we had what is known as an, as an eclipse. And I saw many pictures of some of you with these like old school 3D looking glasses things on your face so you can look at the sun. You ever taking selfies? Like, like it was funny because some of you don't take selfies and you took selfies because you had this. But when you live in West Texas and you don't have that, you, you get this because this is the best, next best thing. This is called a welding helmet. And you put this on and you look and you can see something that's right in front of you that you normally couldn't. And my son did that out in West Texas and this is the picture he got of the eclipse and it has a little green tint to it because the lens on the helmet is green. But the eclipse was right in front of us. But because of the excess of light, we couldn't see it. We couldn't look at it without damaging our eyes. And in this chapter, in chapter three, Paul points out that when it comes to seeing joy, to enjoying joy, to having joy, our perspective and our focus really matters. Now he says this right in the middle. So we're not gonna start at the first of the chapter yet. We're gonna jump right into the middle of the chapter because he says some things and then he says this statement and then he says some more things. So in, in verse 15, he says this, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. All of us who are mature should have this perspective. And he's, we're gonna talk about the perspective that he talks about. And if on some point you think differently, if you don't have the perspective that I've just talked about, I love this. He's like, eh, God will make it clear for you. Like God will help you put a little focus on this perspective so you can see it. And so that's what we're gonna look at today. What perspective should we have and what should we be focused more on and what should we be focused less on? Now, Paul starts out uh, the chapter honestly, like our memory verse, and he says, hey, rejoice in the Lord. And then he kind of goes into this braggadocious um, kind of rant. He's like, I know you have accomplishments in your life, but they pale in comparison to mine. And it sounds, you know, arrogant, but I guess he could back it up. But he says, hey, I'm not just a Hebrew. I am the Hebrew. And he said, I'm not just a Pharisee. I am the Pharisee. And when it comes to righteousness, according to the law, he uses the word flawless, like I'm perfect. There's no one better than me. So basically what Paul is saying is I'm the best at what I do. It would be like if you're a doctor and all the other doctors came to you for advice because you're the best at what you do. That's what Paul says. So, so he lines this out. He says, I understand you have accomplishments, mine or greater. And then he says this in verse seven, and this is where we're gonna pick up the story. He says, but whatever were gains, whatever I thought were important, the things that I attained, the, the things that were important to me, 
to me, I consider law. So, so they once held a high position in my life. Now they hold a low position in my life. I consider them lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, he, he turns it up a notch here and he says, I consider everything a loss. Why? Because of the surpassing worth. Something is so much more worthy than all of my accomplishments is what Paul is saying. He says, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. I consider them garbage in the original language. This actually means dung, like poo, like it should go in the sewer, down the toilet. That's what he, how low he looks at his accomplishments. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. He said righteousness according to the law. He was flawless. He was perfect. But compared to Jesus, I, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but what, that which through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. What is the first perspective that Paul is telling us? He says, hey, if you want to be able to see the joy that is around you, you have got to focus more on Jesus and less on your accomplishments. You have to focus more on Jesus and less on your accomplishments. Now, Several years ago, we were moving into our third house, me and my wife, Shannon. Uh, we were moving into our third house. And this is kind of sort of how this went. When we moved into our first house, we went through a bunch of things and we realized, hey, we're not gonna use these things, so, but, but we don't wanna get rid of them because they mean a lot to us. So we're gonna put them in a box and we're gonna put them in the attic, okay? That's house one. So we buy house two. So do you know what I do? I take the boxes out of the attic and I put them on the moving truck. We move to the second house. And I take the boxes out of the moving truck and I put them back in the attic in house two, right? And, and then we're gonna move to house three. So do you know what I did? I got the boxes out of the attic in box two and I put them in the moving truck and we took them to house three and I said, time out. This is crazy. We, I don't even know what's in these boxes. And so I started opening the box. I found some of Shannon's nursing books and I'm like, yeah, that's trash. And then I opened some stuff and there was some memorabilia from high school. And I'm like, oh, man, good, this is, these are great memories. And I started looking through and I had just these stacks of medals. I was a choir boy. And so I had all these solo and ensemble medals that I had three stacks like this high. And then I had this wooden thing that said corral on it because I was in the corral. It wasn't just a choir, it was the corral. Um, but it had a treble clef um, engraved on it, which was really weird because I didn't sing from the treble clef. I sang from the bass clef, which didn't make any sense to me. But anyway, I had all of this stuff in this box that once meant so much to me. And do you know what I did with it? I give you one guess. Who wants to say it out loud? Garbage. I took it and threw it in the dumpster. What used to hold great value had faded over time. My accomplishments had faded over time. And do you know what never loses its value and never fades over time is Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That his love never fails and that his mercies are brand new every single day. Now, if you're new to church, maybe you're online and you're just checking out church for the first time and you're like, hey, I, 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 I don't really know about this Jesus thing or having a, all of those things. Can I just be real honest with you? Because of where we live, I realize Sometimes it's incredibly difficult to see the need for Jesus. We have so much and we need so little. But I will guarantee you no matter what your accomplishments are, whether they're your personal accomplishments, whether they're accomplishments that, you, that you've attained with your family or your business, they pale in comparison to what Jesus has already done for you and what Jesus can do through you. But it starts with a relationship with him. And so if you're new to church, Maybe you're new to this Jesus thing and you have questions. When we're done in just a few minutes, there's gonna be people right back behind the sound booth. There's a little area back there. They would love to answer any question you have. And if you're online, we have people online ready. You may just message us in and, and we will do our best to help you. Now, for those of you who follow Christ, I think for the most part, we hang on to and value our, the things that we have done, our accomplishments more so than Jesus because we forget. I think we forget how lost we were when Jesus found us. Maybe we never knew how lost we were when Jesus found us. And Paul is saying we 
can find joy right where we are if we would just focus more on Jesus and less on our accomplishments. Now, in verse 13 to 14, he gives us another perspective. So let's take a look at those verses. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself uh, yet to have taken hold of. What is he talking about? Taking hold of the life that God has called him to. He's not there yet. Like he's working on it, he's working towards it, but he's not there yet. But then he says this, but one thing I do, forgetting what is, what's this word? Say it with me. Behind, y'all didn't do that good. Forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead. I press on toward the goal of winning the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, hey, I'm not there yet. But if if you're going to find the joy right where you are, you got to focus more on your future than you do on your past. You gotta focus more on your future than you do on your past. Now, Paul is saying he forgets, he's forgetting what is behind him, he's forgetting his past. And, and all of us here today have had failures. And we love to forget our failures, right? And, and we love to say this, where well, your failures don't define you. And that's true. Your failures don't define you. But Paul doesn't say he's leaving his failures behind him. He says he's leaving everything behind him, which means successes as well. Do you know why? You don't want to hear this, but you're going to hear it because your successes don't define you either. And we don't like that. We're like, I, I'm okay with getting rid of my failures, but I, I want to keep my successes. But this is what Paul's saying. It's really, 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 really hard to move forward when you're looking backwards. I've never seen anybody run a race and be successful that way. I've never even seen anybody walk and be successful that way. He's saying, hey, you gotta face forward. You gotta focus on what's in front of you just one step at a time. Now, I'm not saying you don't learn from your failures and I'm not saying you don't celebrate your successes. But that's what you do. You take a step. You're like, okay, what's the next step? Okay, this is the next step. Okay, what's the next step? Okay, that was a failure. What do I do with that? I learned from it. Okay, I learned. What do I do? The next one's a success. Great. Let's celebrate that. What can I learn from it? Let's move forward. Keep moving forward. And by the way, this is a side note. Some of you need to hear this today. You're not finished until it is finished. Many times we have the attitude or the idea that I've done that, been there, done that, I've served for so many years, it's someone else's turn to do it. That is not what Paul says. If we go back to chapter one in this same book, in in verse six he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, who began a good work in you? Jesus began a good work in you the day you started following him. But he says, in you will carry it on to completion. When will it become complete? On the day of Christ Jesus, you're not finished until it is finished. And it is finished the day you see Jesus face to face. And you're not looking at him, my friend. You're not seeing Jesus face to face right now. There's still things for you to do. I understand that the step may look different. It may feel different. It may, but you have a step. If there's breath in your lungs, you have a step to take. Now, just practically, what does this look like? What does this look like to focus forward? Well, Paul is talking about focusing on the call of God on your life. And so as a church, it's pretty easy for us. God has called LifePoint to a few things. One thing God has called us to is to share Jesus and build believers. So every single day, that's you and that is me. Every single day, we're supposed to share Jesus and build believers. How, what, what am I supposed to be doing today? I'm gonna share Jesus and I'm gonna build believers. How can I do it better? I'm gonna share Jesus. We just keep moving forward. We learn from our mistakes. We, we celebrate our successes, but we keep moving forward to answer the call of God on our church's life. He has asked us, to be a place where anyone can belong before they believe. Do you even know how to do that? That's difficult. And honestly, for me, it's scary sometimes. But God has called us to be a church where anyone can. Okay, so so how do I respond to this? And, And how do I respond to this person? And how should I love this person? Just keep moving forward day after day after day. And then God has called us as a church to go north and to reach the next generation. You're like, well, what about me? I want to be reached. You're here. 
We need to go forward and go north and reach the next generation. How do you do that? One step at a time. How are we going to do this? We're going to take one step. We're going to, okay, what do we need to do? We need to take a step, and we need to learn from our past. We need to celebrate, and we just need to keep moving forward until we meet Christ. Paul is saying, you got to focus on, more on the future than you do the past. And I don't know what you have <laughs> in your past that you need to let go of. Paul's saying, hey, you can't, you can't run this race. You, can't, you cannot get to the point where God wants you to be. Hanging on to it. You got to let go of it and move forward. And you got to focus more on Jesus than your accomplishments. Focus more on the future than your past. And then he gives us one more perspective to look at. In verses 18 through 20. In verse 18 it says, um, for as I have often told you before. So he's repeating something he's already said. And now I tell you again, even in tears. So Paul's passionate. He's, he's like, man, I really want you to get this. And I don't like this verse. There's, there's verses in the Bible I just don't like. This is one of them. He says this, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And, and at first glance, it's like, yeah, I mean, I get that. There's a lot of people against God. There's anti-God, anti-Jesus, anti-church. There's all these people out there. He's not writing to them. He's writing to you, and he's writing to me. He's writing to the church, and he says many in the church live as enemies of the cross of Christ, and I'm like, whew, I do not want that to be me. Like, I, I don't want, and so in 19, he, he takes it even further. He says, their destiny is destruction. I don't want destruction in my life. He says their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. And do you know what makes them enemies of the cross of Christ? Here it is. He tells us their mind is set on earthly things. You're like, whoa, 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 time out. I live on earth. Obviously, I need to focus on some earthly things. But, but let's finish it out. He says, but our citizenship is not here on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await the Savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying we need to focus more on heavenly things and less on earthly things. And we kind of understand this. Like when we travel, we don't always travel with the comforts of home, right? Like we, even when we go on vacation sometimes, sometimes the pillow just doesn't work. Sometimes, sometimes I just throw the pillow on the floor and try to do it without it because it's just not my pillow, right? Or the bed's not comfortable. Or somebody's jumping up and down in the room above you on floor three and you're on floor two and you can't sleep. Like there's, we don't always travel with the comforts of home, but we're okay with that. Why are we okay with that? Because it's temporary. We're not home, right? So several years ago, I got the opportunity to go to India. And to teach the Bosphorus people, there were a, a group, several hundred pastors there, and a group of us went to train these pastors. And so one of, of the pastors that was going, he was my good friend of mine named Kenny, he had already been before, me and Mike, we had not been before, and our wives who were also going had not been before. So we had a meeting, and he's like, hey, so this is what you're going to find out when you get there. Like, like um, it's going to be hot, and we won't have air conditioning. Okay, so I love the outdoors, and even when it's hot, I'm okay with that. But I don't like the heat of the outdoors inside. I, just like, I don't like that at all. And he says, so when you're preaching, like, you're going to need to realize it's going to be really hot. And, and it can be a little dangerous. They could, you know, if someone comes and grabs you off the stage when you're teaching, just go with them. Like, they're, they're hiding you for your safety. And I'm like, man, what is going on? He goes, and here's the biggest thing. You love curry, right? And you love spicy food? And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't like being hot and sweaty, and I don't, like, I don't like any of those things. But you know what? I went, and for nine days, I was perfectly okay living on non. It's all I could eat for nine days. And I sweated, and we were in little cars with, and, and, and oh, my goodness, I've never heard the horn honk so much. And all these things, and you know what? I was okay with that. Because, you know, at the end of nine days, you know what I was going to do? I was going to get on an airplane and I was going to fly for 15 hours and when I landed, I was going to be home. So we understand this and Paul is saying, hey, if you will just realize you're not home yet, but you will be one day, you can enjoy today right where you are knowing that home is coming. So Paul gives us some perspective today. He gives us 
three areas of perspective. I'm gonna throw them up on the screen real quick. Jesus, we gotta focus on Jesus more than we focus on our accomplishments. And we've got to focus on our future more than we focus on our past and then focus on heavenly things more so than earthly things. I just want you to help me here. These three words over here, accomplishments, past, and earth, who do they revolve around? They revolve around me. They're my accomplishments. It's my past. And this is my life that I'm living here on earth. Let's look at the flip side. Who do these focus on? Jesus' future in heaven. Well, it's kind of obvious, the first one, Jesus. Who who holds the future in his hands? Do you do that? No, I don't either. Jesus holds the future in his hand. And who has gone to prepare a place for us called heaven? Jesus. And so when you combine all of these together, Paul is saying, our joy can be found right where we are when we focus more on Jesus and less on us. More on Jesus and less on us. And Paul said it, it was in our memory verse and he said it in the very first verse of this chapter. He says, rejoice, find joy, where? In the Lord. You find joy in Jesus. You gotta focus on Jesus more than we focus on ourselves. So how do you do that practically, right? Like, okay, I get that, Isaac, but how do I do that in a practical way? Well, sometimes we need some lenses to look through. Like if I took these off, I can tell there's people out there, but you could give me all the money in the world and I couldn't tell you who any of you are. But when I put these lenses on, I can see more clearly. I can see better. And our number one lens to look through, to focus on Jesus more and ourselves less, scripture. Do you know why we want you so badly to be here on Sunday mornings? It's because we open up scripture and allow you to see through a different lens. And you know why we want you in small groups? Because every time a small group meets, unless it's some kind of special event, they're gonna open up scripture and allow you to see life through a different lens. You can see it more clearly. And then maybe, (laughs) just maybe, do you know what this lens does? It doesn't make things more clear. It takes things away. This is more of a filter. See, I can look at those lights right above me, but they're really bright, and I would see spots for a while. But if I put this on, I can look directly at it. You know why? Because it filters some of the light out. Maybe you need to apply some filters in your life. What is a distraction to you knowing Jesus more? You don't know what that is? Let me help you. Ask him. Say, God, what in my life is a distraction for me knowing you more and following you to, for the call you've put on my life. What is a distraction? And I can promise you, can I just be, it's just us. You're not gonna like some of the answers because some of the things that you need to filter out of your lives are things that you really like to do. I can't tell you what those are, but man, I sure hope you ask God because Paul tells us in chapter three, we can have joy right where we are when we start focusing on Jesus more and on ourselves less. Would you stand with me as I pray? God, thank you for the opportunity to look through the lens of your scriptures, look through the lens of your word. And God, my biggest prayer before I ever stepped foot on the stage today was that you would bring clarity in people's lives. God, that you would allow people to see more clearly And so, God, I just pray that we as followers, God, that we would ask you and remove, filter out the things that we need to filter out that are distractions and more readily put on the lens of Scripture to the world around us so we can find this joy. And, God, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that hasn't started a relationship with you, God, I pray that if they're online that they would would text in or message in. Or if they're in this room, God, that they would go back behind the sound booth and just ask. We may not get all the answers today, but we can take a step forward. We believe that's what you want us to do, is to keep moving forward. God, thank you for the call on this church. May we, as members of this church, 
as the body of Christ, may we follow you to the best of our ability to answer the calls that you've put on this church. And every single day, may we answer the calls that you've put on our individual lives. Because God, when we do that, we can't help but see joy all around us. It's all around us. God, help us to see it, help us to find it by having the right perspective and having the right focus. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.